coming up on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. We're going to tell you how to winterize your house to, so it's more efficient for winter. As well as homemade vinegar, food scrap vinegar that you can make in your own kitchen, as well as why we will not grow corn in our garden again. We'll also have an interview with horticulture expert William Moss from Chicago. As well as your garden questions and our garden answers. Garden Radio's on the air and it all starts right now. You are tuned in to the only vegetable gardening radio show in Milwaukee with your host, Joey Baird, who grew up in the country but now lives closer to the city, and Holly Baird, who has always been a city girl. Combined, they have over 25 years of gardening experience who believe in simple gardening practices. A gardener for all gardeners, founders of the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, where they created over 800 how-to garden videos to teach others how to grow more of what they eat. Join them for the next hour as they discuss vegetable gardening and more. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show on 860 AM WNOV and W293CX 106.5. Wherever you may be listening, however you may be listening, whether on those particular stations, the TuneIn app, the Simple Radio app, the uh, radio tab on the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com website or anywhere in between. We are live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, gardening partner, Holly Baird. The WisconsinVegetableGardener.com is your destination for over 1,000 garden videos, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and a whole lot of navigation. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener is brought to you by the sponsors you'll hear throughout the program and... Nasala Kombucha is the executive sponsor of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Nasala is made in Wisconsin with local tea and natural herbs. Look for it in the refrigerator aisle at your local grocer. If you don't see it, ask for it because if it's not Nasala Kombucha, it's not kombucha. Find out more at nasala.com. You can also contact us, talk to us right now on the program on the Ivy Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard Hotline. You can also Tweet us using hashtag TWVG. You can email us at TWVGradio at gmail.com. But if you want to call in and talk to us, you can do that. And on the IvyOrganic.com hotline, Ivy Organic 3-1 Plant Guard naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn, insects, and rodents, protects newly installed plants and trees, shields pruned and damaged surfaces, for use on your roses, fruit, and nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. For more information, visit ivorganics.com. You can call in at 414-444-5250. We always uh, like talking with you, uh, whether through the ivorganics.com hotline or via social media. And uh, we've got an uh, announcement we need to make uh, to help out one of our sponsors. Let's talk about the official garden center, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, Blue Mills. Yeah, Blue Mills is trying to get nominated for the... Well, they, they, well, they are, are nominated. nominated. I mean, yeah. They're trying to win the Milwaukee A-List for the Best Garden Center and Best Landscaping Categories. Uh, they were voted Best Garden Center in 2013, 2014, and 2016 on the Milwaukee A-List. And I voted on Thursday. Holly, you voted last night. And it's very easy. You don't have to do anything special. You don't have to, you know, you just go to bluemels.com and scroll to the bottom of the page and it says vote now. You just fill out the little form. You have to, you know, log in. It's, but yeah, it's pretty simple. Yeah, There's it's very nothing, simple. nothing much to do. Uh, There's no spam or anything, but it just so it, it, show, it shows them that you're an actual person, that you're not just some person clicking 9,000 times on a vote uh, tab somewhere. So uh, I encourage you to go over on bluemails.com and vote for them as the number one or the, the first, uh, the winner of the best garden center in Milwaukee. So we appreciate their support and we appreciate your support of them and all of our sponsors. And uh, we're gonna be uh, harvesting some winter squash today. We're gonna be digging up some sweet potatoes as well as planting some more garlic. Uh, and you'll be able to see that on Tuesday's video. Uh, we're kind of wrapping things up in the garden. Uh, we did get rain, which is, uh, I don't know how much that's going to help right now. We're seven inches behind uh, normal rainfall. But hey, it's July. some rain. Right. Mm -hmm. So with that all being said, it's cool, it's chilly. Uh, the winter is coming. So we want to winterize our homes. And, and it kind of falls in the garden category, you know, being self-sufficient, being um, taking care of yourself type of uh, umbrella. So we're going to talk about ways to you can be more uh, winterizing your house on the cheap. Obviously, yes. we can spend a lot of money and do a lot of things and replace a lot of stuff. We're going to go over uh, eight things here in which you can do 
to save money in your home during the winter and to make it a little more enjoyable because the winters here are not that pleasant sometimes. Right. So the first thing is, is and it's something that you can do, yeah, to winterize your house, but also to make sure that you're warm versus freezing in your own home. So uh, the first thing you want to do is make sure the windows are closed and latched. Seems like simple thing, but, you know, you close your windows and I've walked around and it's been winter and I've noticed that they're not latched. They're closed, but you latch them, you get that complete seal with that weather stripping at the bottom makes a big difference whether you have old windows or new windows so make sure they're latched and, and just for security purposes too it, it's that's smart too but just go around and make sure all of them are closed because that little bit that tiny little bit of gap can allow that cold air come in makes a tremendous difference over a two or three month period of getting that cold air in right so that's since we're talking about weather stripping you want to check the weather stripping in the doorways for gaps i know our back door one time it snowed a lot and there was snow between the coming in yeah snow coming in <laughs> between the essentially the screen door and the regular door so obviously um maybe it's not as weather stripped as much as it should be so definitely check for that well another way you can do that it, very simple you, you you know you see these things you can hold a, a candle or a lighter just go outside when it's dark, somebody go on the inside, somebody go on the outside with a flashlight and just shine around the perimeter of the door. And if you can see light come in, you've got holes that you need to close up because, oh, it's just a little crack. Well, a little crack at negative two degrees is a lot of cold air that's coming into your home uh, over the winter months and uh, money that you're spending heating that cold air that doesn't need to come in in the first place. Right. And with that being said, if you don't have the ability, maybe it's a second floor window or something like that, but you feel that or door a, or door, yeah. you feel that there's definitely a draft. You can take caulk and make sure you, you seal that silicone up or silicone. Um, and then also you can use the plastic, which is they sell it at most hardware stores. It's a plastic that you apply with um, like basically a hair dryer mm -hmm. that is essentially keeps the the cold out a little it, bit it's a giant sheet of saran wrap essentially you adhere it to the frame of the window you use a hair dryer to heat it to stretch it to tighten it back or to, to tighten it back up so it's like a mini window of plastic and we done that in one room and it made a tremendous difference uh just over the winter a couple of years ago especially if you have a window that you know that is quite drafty or it gets a lot of wind coming in or coming from that direction it's definitely something to uh, to consider well also on the filling the cracks in around the window if you just got a small little crack let's say it's two inches or three inches and you know there's air coming in and you don't want to go to the hardware store and buy silicone for four or five dollars a tube or however much it is just use toothpaste use toothpaste at that's a, at a very thick jelly type of or gel type of material that will fill and seal that crack in just like silicone but you don't want to use this on a large uh, application you want to uh, make sure it's uh, the same color like probably white like your window so that you're not putting some blue or green toothpaste right but in. what I'm saying is for a little small hole that works very well instead of having to invest in a large tube of silicone that you're only going to use a small amount and then throw it in the uh, drawer and forget about it and it dries up and you never have never be able to use it again so that does work mm -hmm. so what what's another way in which we can winterize the house on the cheap because we're all about being efficient with what we have and not having to spend any extra additional dollars to make things happen well i think you could probably explain this um, insulating your water heater water heaters are probably the one the most inefficient item we have in our home it's a big cylinder full of water and once it gets below a certain temperature it heats back up then it drops down and it heats back up whether you're there or not for days you and weeks you can be gone and that water heater once it drops to a certain temperature it'll put energy back in to warm that water back up and, and, and it, that's just a very wasteful amount of energy and it's the way it's been from day one so there are sleeves or like giant blankets that you can purchase of insulation that are designed to go around the actual cylinder of the water heater to actually hold more heat in so there's less energy have uh, less time that water heater has to um, uh, turn on to keep that water warm inside so that's another way it's a small investment for a long-term gain on uh, savings in your home definitely so that's the water heater. Insulate your attic. Many people don't realize that maybe your attic is not as insulated as it should be. Your attic is like your head. Mm -hmm. A lot of heat escapes out of the attic of your home. Just like you see these reporters and you look at anybody that, that talks about wearing a hat during winter. What is it? 80, 90 percent of the heat loss is from your head. Right. Uh, and, and when I grew when I was growing up, 
uh, I'd always, we'd always, you know, watch the news at home, and my parents would always say, "Why does those reporters never wear hats?" What, and that's the only thing they ever, you know, that's, that's the, <laughs> they, they never wore hats. Well, the, your your ha- head is where a lot of your heat loss is. Same thing for your attic; heat rises. So if you can check and see where the heat loss is in your attic just a small investment can make uh, an amount uh, a tremendous amount of savings of keeping your house warm as well as uh, in, uh you know keeping it uh, saving money on energy definitely okay so your attic um replace your furnace filter just like any type of filter whether it be your car engine filter or your um furnace filter when it gets blocked up with stuff it's not going to work as efficiently right yeah and and those are cheap to to get uh, check it. Uh, uh, I don't know what the recommendations are, but I would say you know every month, every other month. You can if you're if you're a smoker, you want to check it more frequently if you smoke in the house because it's pulling air from internally, recirculating through the furnace or air conditioner, and then disper- uh, putting it back out a- as a conditioned or heated air. So you want to check that. Uh, and make sure you get a model number so you're not going to the store going, well, I think this looks right, and it's not. Yeah, that could be fun. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, with that, and, and what else we have here? Um, fleece or fl- flannel sheets on the bed. If you are a warm sleeper, this might not be a good idea for you because you might just wake up too hot and upset. But if you are somebody who is often cold at night, uh, those fleece or flannel sheets can make a difference. Right. And... Uh, and some of us may already have them. We do that. We switch them out uh, as as it gets cooler uh, to keep the bed, uh, you know. The, and then we have a, a wool blanket we'll toss on top on the really cold nights, um, which makes a difference, too. And you've heard this from day one of anybody that, that rents or knows what a thermostat is. Instead of having it 74 degrees, put it at 68 degrees. You're not going to notice that big of a difference. And when you leave, turn it down. When you come home, you can turn it up. Some of these uh, new thermostats are programmable. If you really are high tech, some of these run off, I believe, smartphones now where, oh, I'll be home in an hour or I can program it to when I'm gone, it'll drop when I come home. That's a whole other level of technology that many of us may not want to uh, endure. So just keeping it at a cooler temperature makes a big difference as, uh, 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 on, the, on the heating bill, uh, on the efficiency of your home. Uh, additionally... Uh, while we're talking about this, I do want to make mention uh, it's not so much of a winter rising of the home, but checking your smoke detectors. Let's let's be smart yeah, it about was, it. It was uh, fire prevention week this week. Was it? Right. So you should check your smoke detectors, um, make sure they work, check the batteries. And then also, if your smoke detector is more than 10 years old, it should be replaced. Oh, is that the standard? Mm-hmm. Now, I think if you cannot afford a smoke detector, get a hold of your local fire station, and they can provide one for you. I'm not, I'm not 100% sure about but that. But that seems can, about right. Yeah, you could certainly give them a call. Yeah, and see. because a small investment is a whole lot cheaper than a bunch of people dead. Yes. And I'm just being straight honest with you. You know, uh, a $3 battery preventing the whole, you know, family being, you know, that. So check that. Um, anything else that we can winterize in our home? Uh, just be just be smart about. Yeah, especially you know sometimes people like on a Sunday afternoon or something they're sitting there relaxing, doing whatever, um, and all of a sudden you know you catch a chill and you're like oh I'm cold I'm going to turn the heat up. Sometimes just moving around a little bit is going to you know bring that blood flow back to you and open the window blinds. Open the window blinds. Yeah, open the window blinds on a sunny day during the winter. Um, definitely something just to kind of get that chill out of the air. So we hope that that has helped uh, bring to light some of the things that maybe you can do on the very uh, affordable level to make your uh, winter a little more enjoyable inside because winters around here are very long, very cold, and and uh, we want to check up on our neighbors who are not maybe that uh, elderly neighbors or those who are disabled. Uh, we want to check up on them to make sure that they are okay. Uh, we hear that on the news, but... Uh, It's always nice to be uh, proactive instead of reactive. So when we come back, we're going to talk about making your own homemade vinegar, Mm -hmm. as well as why Holly and I will never grow sweet corn in our backyard garden ever again, right after this. Tweet Joey and Holly using hashtag TWVG. 
Scott Chanu, 125 years of experience producing stone, ground, organic flour and cornmeal made from premium quality whole grains. Family owned company, continual standards that are non-GMO, organic at the highest safety levels. Offering a wide variety of flours, pasta, baking mixes, flaxseed and more. Even kosher and gluten free options. Found at most local grocers like Woodman's. For more information and recipes, visit HodgsonMill.com. That's H-O-D-G-S-O-N-M-I-L-L.com. The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants to multiple gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds. Rootmaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit Rootmaker.com. Do you have a little space to grow? Check out Greenstock Vertical Gardens at GreenstockGarden.com. Greenstock is engineered to grow with its innovative space and water saving design. You can grow vegetables, flowers, herbs, and even strawberries in just two square feet of space. Grow up instead of out. Perfect for the porch, patio, or deck. Grow up to 30 plants in a small space. Greenstockgarden.com has everything you need to grow in the littlest of spaces. Proudly made in the USA. For more information and to purchase, visit greenstockgarden.com. I want a garden center that listens to and understands my needs. I want to buy my gardening products from a local business with strong ties to the community. All I want is a garden center that truly values their customers. It seems like everyone is selling plants these days, but I'm having a hard time finding quality. I take pride in my garden, so I want my garden center to take pride in their products. Where will you be going for all of your gardening needs this season? Blue Mel's Garden Center. We are your answer. Blue Mel's 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. Back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your hosts Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show. So happy you've joined us on this Saturday morning here in Milwaukee and wherever you may be listening around the country on replay and uh, in studio video replay. Well, uh, we still uh, tree uh, ripe dot com has fresh produce and citrus uh, that is coming to Milwaukee. All right. If you like fresh produce delivered right to your neighborhood, you should check out Tree Ripe Citrus Company, where you can find you can find out where to pick up top quality produce from tree ripe dot com. Um, in be, be around the beginning of the year, they'll have citrus, they have grapefruits, they have oranges, they have these oranges that are called honey bells, which are very juicy oranges, and they're super delicious. So definitely check that out if you're you know the, the citrus time. It's the best citrus that you could get, and it comes right from the stores source fresh off the truck. For location and schedules, you can visit tree-ripe.com. They'll have locations all over including Iowa, Upper and Lower Michigan, Minnesota, Illinois, and right here in Wisconsin. Tree-ripe.com is your go-to for the freshest produce around. Well, with that being said, let's talk about making vinegar. Now, there are two types of vinegar uh, in the store. There is what's called white vinegar, and then there is called apple cider vinegar. That would be the raw vinegar. That would be the raw mm -hmm. vinegar. Now, uh, let's define both of them, if you can, before we get into how we m can make our own vinegar. So, regular white vinegar or... Next to it on the shelf is the, it's more of the processed, um, there's apple cider vinegar too, which is similar, but it's not raw. So it's going to be the stuff that's usually in a plastic jug. It's a brown tinted color. Yeah, that's the apple cider like vinegar. It looks like a tea. And then white vinegar as well. And um, White vinegar is processed by corn. Yeah, it's corn. It's a corn based product. Right. So it's still acidic. It's still very useful in canning. If you're ever canning anything and it says to use... Um, apple cider vinegar or white vinegar, you're going to want to use that. The stuff that's, you go there, look at the bottom of the shelf. El, by the Cheapo. El Cheapo. That's what you want to use. However, raw vinegar or fermented vinegar is um, usually in a glass container. It's a little bit more costly and it'll say raw on it and it usually says organic or something like that. Um, there's a certain brand that right. most people are familiar with. Um, but it's the the raw vinegar, and this has the fermentation. It usually will say like with the mother on it, and the mother is the 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 microbial basis of right. the creation of that vinegar start. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the benefits people feel that there's many benefits to apple cider vinegar. They'll clean their home with it. They'll drink it. I put it. I put it every morning in my mor in my smoothie, my breakfast smoothie. Uh, reduces heartburn. It reduces heartburn. Um, 
they say it helps if you are feeling more um alkaline it helps or you, helps you become more alkaline i guess so adjust your ph, adjust in, your your body. pH yeah. in your body yeah so it's definitely good for you a lot of people swear by it during flu season they say that it boosts their immune system I'm not making these promises, but I do know that it um, does fix the heartburn. It does fix the heartburn. I, I, I've had that, and you take about a teaspoon of it; it'll knock you to your knees. That raw <laughs> vinegar, but it, it instantly it cleanses and, and reduces the heartburn yeah. that you have. You're, it's basically people are like, "Well, that's acidic, isn't that bad?" But it's like fighting fire with fire. That acid. Is We're not talking drinking gallons here. No, <laughs> no, no, no. Please, I don't even know. What, I don't even know how anybody could drink a, a gallon of that. But definitely, just a tablespoon or something right. or a teaspoon um, is good. Is good for the heartburn. So how do uh, we, we talked about the store bought? We talked about the the El Cheapo. We talked about the raw. Now, if we're going to make our own vinegar at home, what different kinds of vinegar can we make, and what is the process in which we need to sure. do? Sure. So you can make it with apple scraps, pear scraps, or pineapple scraps. That's it. No other. That's it. You can't do mm -hmm. tomatoes or any kind of other stuff like that. And it's a couple. It takes a couple months. Okay. So if you are if you are going apple picking, maybe not today, yeah. but um, anytime. <laughs> and you're like, I have all these apple scraps. I made pie. I mean, this, that, and the other thing. Um, you can do this, and it's pretty simple. So what you do is you take like a half gallon jar. Well, it doesn't have to be like clean apples. I mean, if you have an apple that's or, or a pear that has splashed on the pavement, you can cut the bad portion off or use the core. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be like pristine apples or pears. No, or, uh, no, because you're gonna you're basically gonna ferment it. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, you're so gonna take a jar. you have the the peels, the cores, the tops, whatever. Um, so that's what you're going to use. And you take a jar. You want to kind of cut the stuff to all about the same size. Right. You don't have to. You can just use the whole pear. You don't have to specifically use the pear, the, the cores or the, the skins or the... Right. But mm, that's... Okay. It's something to get rid of the scraps. Right. But you can use the whole pear. Um, so you're going to take a jar and you want it... If you want a lot, you're going to probably maybe do a couple jars. You don't have to use a, a certified mason jar, but it needs to be um, something that you can get a... Um, you can put like a cloth or a coffee filter or something over the top. So what you want to do, because you don't want stuff to get a in there. A bucket's not really recommended in this situation. No, no. Something either ceramic or glass. Okay. So then you put your all your scraps in there, and then you're going to fill it with water. You want to use uh, filtered water so it doesn't have to be... So no chlorine. No chlorine. Okay, so no. for those who are in the city who has chlorate, chlorated water, what you want to do is you want to figure out how much you need put it in a bowl or a jar or a pitcher and let it set for 12, 24 hours. That chlorine will evaporate out of the water and then it's safe to use. So that's that's how you get rid of that instead of having to get a water filter. Right. Just so, allow yeah. it evaporate and then you're good to go. Right. Exactly. So you want to do that and then you just cover it. Now you're going to take, put a couple tablespoons. If it's about a half gallon jar, you're going to put at most a quarter cup of sugar because um, that's going to help start the fermentation process. If you have some raw apple cider vinegar, you can put a couple tablespoons of that in there as well. And what that's going to do is that's going the enzymes in that already created vinegar is going to help jumpstart the process in your batch that you're creating now. Right. So then you're going to you're going to fill uh, cover up with water, make sure everything's submerged, and then you're going to put a coffee filter, cheesecloth. Um, breathable material. Breathable material over the top of it, and take we take rubber bands, and that's what we do. And then we stir. It. You stir it once to twice a day. And you don't want to fill it all the way to the brim because because of the reaction that the breakdown process, the sugar is eating all this. Yeah, you want to leave it, about an inch it, at the it top. It does overflow. Mm -hmm. It will overflow. So you want to be sure you have some uh, head space or gap there at the top. Just a warning. So you're going to do this for about a week. And you'll start to twice yeah, a day. Twi twice a day. You'll start to smell it. It's gonna smell, and you want to do this in a, in a room temperature area away from direct sunlight. And if you see any mold, then you just, unfortunately you have to dump it. So that's why you want to keep stirring it because it's gonna prevent that mold from happening. The, the turnover of that material. Right. So then, so then once you get to about a week, you'll smell it. It's gonna start to smell like apple wine. Essentially, it's gonna start to smell kind of boozy. Mm -hmm. Um, so this, at this point, what you're going to do is you're going to take a uh, cheesecloth or paper towels and you're going to dump it um, into a bowl or something so that it filters out. So you, if you have like a mesh strainer, you can do that. So you're taking the, the you're, you're going to separate the liquids from the solids mm -hmm. and, and get rid of the solid portions and compost that. And then once you separate that liquid, you're going to put that liquid back in the jar right. that it came from. Right. Okay. So you're going to rinse the jar out. You don't have to like scrub, scrub it, it or anything out. like that, but just rinse it out so there's not like chunks in there and then you're going to so you may maybe you're gonna put it in a smaller jar depending on how much liquid you have 
And then you put the sit, you can put the cheesecloth or whatever on top of it, and you just stir it every day, and it's gonna ferment, and it's going to it's gonna go from smelling boozy to all of a sudden it's gonna smell like vinegar almost overnight. Almost well, not overnight, in, but in, in a couple of days time. period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And sometimes it takes if it's a large batch. And, and it room temperatures greatly determine on how quickly this occurs too. Right. So ideally, you want to be about at average the, home temperature. Average home temperature seventy to seventy two degrees. But that's what happens, and all of a sudden you're like, you, you know, we s- sniff ours every day, and then all of a sudden we have, all of a sudden, you know, it just smells like vinegar. Now, once the process has got to a vinegar stage, what do you do with it then? Do you have to put it in the fridge? Is it sell- shelf-stable? What's the procedure at this point? It's, it's shelf-stable. You can put it in the fridge if you want, or you can just leave it on the shelf. If you want to cover it. Um, you always want to make sure all, anything that you, you're doing is covered because you don't want flies or something getting in there, dust, particles, what have you. So you want to make sure you cover it at this point with the, the lid for the jar. Or if, if you were doing this in some sort of crock, you want to make sure you're putting it into other jars or bottles. So, and, and then once the batch, let's say you do two or three batches in, in different time periods, once they all get to that vinegar stage, then can we incorporate them all together so we can finish filling a certain jar full? Yeah, you can. You can mix. We don't have to keep them designated to no. their own batch type no. of thing. But yeah. one, but you can't mix during the procedure. You have to wait until the completion is done, right. and then you can mix them together. Right. A- and and again, uh, this can take anywhere from what a couple of months to uh, a couple of weeks to several months. Yeah, it depends on how much it is and how how much you have. Now, and then, yeah. now with this vinegar. This is not vinegar in which you can use for safe canning. You can use this vinegar for anything else you want, excluding the canning procedure because you don't know what percentage of acidity that vinegar is at unless you get a test kit and go through all those steps. Right. So you want to you can use it for anything else, but for canning you don't know if the acidity is going to be consistent. So you want to um you want to make sure that you're being mindful of that. Now, we did this last year. We've got a pear tree in the front yard, and, and, and the pear tree kind of sets half on the grass and half on the, pa- you know, the overhang. So when the pears fell on the pavement, most of them were shattered but squashed, so they weren't edible to eat. But we were able to clean, get, get the, the portions cut off that were usable and we created the food scrap vinegar with it and we created fi- uh, we, we produced or made about five and a half gallons of vinegar last year mm-hmm. that is a lot yes <laughs> it is. and we've given some away yeah. um to friends and family and, and you and use some every day in your, your yeah. smoothie mm-hmm. and then with the heartburn if i have it i'll use it that type of thing i use it to clean my my uh, stinky sandals the other day yeah, too, oh that's, so. that's good yeah uh, but it, it it's a very uh, a, a, a easy way to make it and just you know you need a jar some sc- either pear, apple, or pineapple scraps. So if you have the pineapple, whenever you get it at the store, you got the the skin that you pulled off of it. Or you can make some pineapple vinegar uh, instead of just throwing it in the trash. So there you go. A- and then some sugar. Very affordable. Very easy to make your own vinegar. Well, another thing that you can uh, do is uh, we'll get to. Uh, figure out why we don't grow corn at a later date because we're not planting corn now so we'll hold that uh, <laughs> for a later date uh, you can get a hold of errands and they can help you take care of your lawn for next year do you hear that that's your neighbor shaking in their grass stained shoes because errands is about to help you step up your grass cutting game your name is on the mailbox so the errands name should be on your mower heavy duty steel construction smarter smoother controls professional cutting performance the only thing we love more than the smell of freshly cut grass is a sweet taste of victory errands it comes down to this visit errands.com to find your local dealer for lawn and pretty soon snow removal equipment when we come back horticultural expert william moss will be with us he has been with us before he's rejoining us again right after this have a gardening question email joey and holly at twvgradio at gmail.com you say you say nasala kombucha it'll put some glide in your stride and some pep in your step nasala kombucha <laughs> yeah nasala kombucha makes your body happy nasala kombucha makes your body smile 
Susan Barley Marketing Cafe, a neighborhood specialty grocery store for the east side and greater Milwaukee area where you can find all you need from fresh produce to bakery to organic frozen dinners, from wine to fresh used carrot juice, a health food store with hundreds of products, vitamin supplements, bath and body items, magazines, cars, books, and a knowledgeable staff. Catering available. Open daily at 8 a.m. The restaurant serves breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week with a menu of good, healthy, homemade food, including vegetarian and non-vegetarian specialties. 1901 East North Avenue, Milwaukee, 414-278-7878, and online at beansandbarley.com. Mycorrhizae is a beneficial fungus from plantsuccess.com that will greatly increase your plant's germination, ability, and a healthier root structure. You can increase seed sprouting, root growth, and general plant germination. Mycorrhizae can be used with hydroponics, root cutting, seed sprouting, coca core, and soil. Plantsuccess.com carries powder, granule, and tablet forms of mycorrhizae. Increase the level of mycorrhizae in your soil for your plants to give them the optimal opportunity to produce an incredible harvest. For more information and to purchase, visit plantsuccess.com. The River West Co-op Grocery and Cafe is proud to support the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener and a lot of other Wisconsin growers as well. The Co-op offers a wide range of local and organic produce in their store and on their cafe menu. From apples to yogurt and everything in between. Open 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. weekdays, 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. weekends at the corner of Clark and Frackney in Milwaukee's River West neighborhood. See what is in store and check out the Co-op Cafe delicious vegetarian menu at riverwestcoop.org. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show. So happy you've joined us here on 860 AM WNOV and W293CX 106.5, the TuneIn app, the Simple Radio app, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com radio tab. Uh, that is the, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. Dot com is the place for 1,000 plus garden videos, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and a whole lot more, as well as Blue Mills, the official garden center of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, uh, also has a whole lot of stuff. Uh, lawn uh, landscaping, you can they can do on your property. They can do uh, free consultations on uh, taking care of your property, as well as they got flowers, mums, bulbs, on a whole lot more at their location. And where can we find Blue Mills? Blue Mills is at 4930 West Loomis Road in Greenfield. Um, you can go to bluemills.com or call 414-282-4220. Well, let's go to the ivyorganics.com hotline, Holly, and bring in our next, next guest. He visited us. He, he was on the show mid-June, and uh, we invited him back because he's full of knowledge and... Uh, he's a master gardener, horticulture educator, media expert, and all-around great guy. Uh, he's on various media platforms. He explains how to grow sustainably and have gardening success through TV, radio, print, presentations, and workshops. He uses gardening and greeting to inspire people to get out and grow. Welcome to the program, Mr. Moss. Hello. How you guys doing? We're doing very good. We appreciate you taking time to join us on the program again. Well, it was fun last time, and I... You know, I I was rushed because I was headed out the door to do a ladybug release. So now I got a little bit more time. We we can get we can have some fun. Well, it's getting fall time, and and we're a vegetable show, so we don't know a thing about flowers for the most part. Uh, what is what? When is the right time to plant bulbs, and how can we plant the bulbs? And is it only are they only good in the ground, or can we also do them in containers? So um, you know, I'm a I'm somewhat of a bulb expert. I teach the I teach the Hardy Bulb course with a good friend of mine at the Chicago Botanic Garden. So I could talk for the next two days about this, but <laughs> but I'll try to I'll try to condense it down just a little bit. Um, you can plant bulbs any time in the fall. September's best for most of them, but October's a really good time. And we've been lucky because it's been warm, so the soil will still be nice and warm and receptive. You want to get them in the ground while the ground is still. Um, unfrozen because the roots have to grow the thing about bulbs is they're active from the time you put them in the ground all the way to spring they're doing something only in summer do they not get active so you want to get them in the ground uh, as soon as possible start now especially daffodils you want to get them down there you want to plant bulbs about three times as deep as they are wide so whatever the package says hopefully is right but if it doesn't say that ignore the package listen to me three times as deep as it is wide and when you plant them you want to dig a big hole. I know you guys have seen those little small, like small bulb planters, where it's just like for one bulb. Right. Uh, don't 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 waste your time or money on that. Get you get to, dig you a big hole, and then you put them in because the one thing about bulbs is they look better in mass. To have two or three tulips or five tulips is nothing compared to having 
50 tulips. These things are not there forever. They're more like, like the spice of your garden. So you want to make sure that you get the, that it's enough spice. You know how it is when you're cooking. You put a little bit of curry on something, nobody tastes it. But, you know, you got to put enough curry where it, where it makes the dish feel authentic. So it's the same way with bulbs. Use them like spice and plant a ton of them. Now, can we, do, can we just do this in uh, the ground, or, or is containers, like, not recommended for doing bulb planting? Some bulbs do very well in containers, um, like, like daffodils would do well. If you can find a protected place, they can't stay out exposed, but if you can put them maybe in an unheated garage or maybe, like, in a window well or maybe on the east side of a house where there's some protection, um, they, they, they'll do well. But there's some bulbs, like Scylla, Lilies, and tulip tartar, I know it's not a popular one, but it's a little small tulip. Lilies can do it, too. You put those in containers, they can be completely exposed. They're actually on my rooftop 365 days a year. When it's like negative 20, those bulbs are up there in negative 20, and they still come out. So there are a few that can make it. If you got some extra scylla or, like I said, tulip tartar or lilies, but most of them, you, you put them in containers, and you put them somewhere sheltered, and they'll do just fine. And it's especially true for daffodils. Um, let me hop in really quick because I knew I was coming in on you guys' show today. So me and my wife put together a uh, special download for your listeners about bulbs. Okay. So if you go to um, my site, which is getoutandgrow.org, and then backslash WVG show, there will be a little pamphlet there that talks about my favorite bulbs, how to plant them, what they do, and all of that. So just for your listeners, we put this together so, uh, you know, so – so that my blah blah and won't won't just keep going. So they'll have something to look at. <laughs> well, we appreciate well. that. Uh, we'll get that up on the website, thewisconsinvegetablegardener dot com, here in just a, a little while. Uh, with that being said, uh, nights are getting colder. Frost and winter will be here soon. Some may, people may have tender plants in containers they want to bring in to keep by window over winter. What is the best way to do this without possibly bringing all kinds of bugs that are in the soil and on the plant? Okay, a couple, of, a couple of quick things about that. I love what you guys talked about earlier about winterizing your home. Now, one of the reasons I don't always seal all my cracks is because some of my house plants, like, like agave and amaryllis, I like to be a little colder than the 72. They, they're more comfortable around 60. So I actually use some of my house plants as like an extra insulator buffer. They, get, they, they, they collect all the cold air, which keeps it from flowing in, but it keeps the roots a little cooler than that 72, sometimes 75 that it gets in the house. So if you've got a, if you got a drafty window, you know, seal it if you need to, but if you've got plants, throw some amaryllis throw, you know, bulbs in there, throw a few agaves in there. Now, as far as bringing them in when they're outside, of course you want to let them have that good summer vacation. Bring them in. you really got to inspect them. Look on the underside of the leaves. Do this all outside. Get you an old cloth. Get your spray hose out. Spray the plant down good. Turn over the underside. Check the leaves. You're looking for anything. You know, spiders and, and bugs can easily be pushed out. They're not a problem. Even if they come in the house, they're not a problem. The number one thing you're looking for, though, are thrips. These little bitty tiny uh, cigar-shaped insects that are on the underside of the leaf. If you don't know what they are, don't worry about it. Just take the, a, a cloth and make sure that you wipe off the plant well, especially the undersides. If you do all of that, you're pretty much set. If the pot is small enough, like if it's a 6-inch pot or 8-inch pot, what I'll do to save time or, or to save energy, not time, is I'll drop the whole pot down in a bucket of water, let it sit there for like five, six hours. Any critters will have to swim out and get out the bucket. Then I just brush that top debris off the water, pull my pot out, and it's completely clean and watered for the next month or so. So um, definitely sit your plants out, but when you bring them in, give them that inspection good, and they're small enough, give them a soaking too. T take a little time, and it'll save you a lot of headache down the road. Sure will. It sure will, because you don't want to bring in, like I said, thrips will attack every plant. That's the worst. But also people sometimes bring in ant colonies. I've done that before. I've got a big pot, and I, I couldn't soak it. It was too big. I brought it in. And, of course, then I had ants living in the pot all winter, crawling out, bothering me. So, you know, if you can, if you can figure a way to clean them out first, it just makes it easier. Well, now is the time that many people will divide plants out in their garden. Number one, what does that mean, dividing plants, and how does an individual know if a plant that they have, which is most likely a perennial, can be divided, and what's the best way to go about doing such a, uh, an activity? So once again, this is a massive topic, but, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. but, the, short, but the short side of it is um, most perennials will outgrow themselves if left in one spot. They'll get really big, and sometimes you'll see that 
center ring, lots of perennials that grow from the inside out, like asters, or sometimes you can see it with daylilies even. They'll, they'll have a lot of growth on the outer edge. It's particularly true with irises. A lot of growth on the outer ring of it, and the inside won't quite be filled in. Same thing with ornamental grasses will happen. So if you had your plant longer than three years, it's time to look at it and see. Does it still have the same shape? Is there any part that's dying back? Does it still have vigor? Uh, you know, and if it doesn't have that vigor or the shape is going wrong, then it could be a time to divide it. Or if it's just growing too big and pushing other plants out the way. Some things just become garden beasts and you just want to move them, move them out the way like asters or joe pies. So what you want to do for them is go out, dig the entire clump up, the entire clump. Use a, use a, use a, a garden fork to do this if you can. Garden forks are my favorite tool for this time of year because I can dig up without damaging things. I can lift things out the ground. Once you've got the whole clump out the ground, whether it's a clump of hookara or daylilies or monarda, whatever it is, then you take a garden spade and slice through them. And what you want to do when you slice through it, you don't have to do this in any sort of particular order, but you want to make sure that each clump has roots and some growing points on it. You'll see the growing points on top. There'll be little small nubs on top of the crowns coming out. And the bottom, of course, you'll see roots. What you don't want to do is slice off something horizontally so that you've got roots on the bottom and eyes on the top. That's not going to work, and it may either kill the plant or set it back for years. But good division, if you divide the plant correctly and give them each nice roots and also some good eyes on top, they'll, they'll have a lot more vigor next year. And plus, you have something to give away. I say... When you divide perennials, you bring your close friends over because what you want to do is you want them to help you so you can get through quicker, and then you give them plants and then go to their garden and get some of their favorite plants in return. Definitely. Um, so many... So, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, for gardeners who have closed down their gardens for the year, is there anything you would suggest they can do now to get ready for spring, like we tell people to put leaves on their garden? Well, you know, definitely put the leaves down because what you want to try to do is you guys are natural, and I love that, and I'm, I'm as natural as I can be gardening in Chicago, and um, you want to try to mimic nature's regular cycle. So what happens, what happens is nature drops all these leaves down, and we think of it sometimes as being a mess, but it's not. What that is, those are th that's nature's way of adding nutrients. That's nature's compost. So putting the leaves on the garden is the right thing to do because, as, as you're saying, if you, want, if, you want the, if you want energy out of something, you know, or, 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 or if you want to get the best nutrients out of it, let it fall to the ground, it'll decompose, and then the plants can use it again next year. And it won't be those, like, quick nutrients that'll wash away. They'll be locked up in organic molecules where they won't wash away. They'll stay in your soil, not go down the drain and pollute rivers and stuff like that. So using your natural fertilizer is, is the best possible thing. If you don't have a lot of leaves, then you can do, you make your own compost and do that as well. So I always suggest in the fall, actually now is a little too early, maybe like, you know, the start of November would be a good time to, to put a layer of compost to your whole garden. If it's the vegetable garden, you can put down six inches of leaf, of leaf mold, leaf compost, whatever you got, horse manure, right on top of that and leave it there. If it's the, if it's the perennial garden, you only want to put down two to three inches because you don't want to smother your plants. You want to make sure they still can, can breathe and make sure that if they have some growth spurts or, or when they start to try to grow in the spring, they can still make it up and out. So for the perennial garden, I recommend now about two to three inches of compost around the plants and around the shrubs and trees. For the vegetable garden, go ahead and pile it on because you took a lot of nutrients out growing all your, growing all your tomatoes and peppers and, t and potatoes and other hungry crops. You want to make sure those nutrients get put back in the soil. And while it's there for free with the leaves, you may as well take it, right? Absolutely. Definitely. <laughs> right? right? One more thing about, one more thing about yeah. vegetables. You guys are going to touch on corn. I don't know what you were going to say, but, <laughs> but let me just say re really quickly about that. I tell people in the community garden all the time, don't waste your time growing corn because the raccoons, the squirrels, and the mice – We'll take it right before it's right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So that's, that's one reason that we always tell people, well, if you're going to grow corn, I don't know if you want to do it in this garden. <laughs> Absolutely. I want to touch on, you talked about using uh, the compost and the leaves, and, and if you go another step, organic fertilizer, because it doesn't uh, uh, obtain or, or bond to water molecules. And if you've watched news, Lake Erie, is, or Lake, yeah, I believe it's Lake Erie, has a massive uh, algae bloom now. And that is because of the fertilizer runoff. Well, so does like that Michigan. Is, yeah. That is 100% true. One, one of the things, you know, we went through a big stage where we're like, it doesn't matter how the plant gets the chemical, just give it the chemical. Well, uh, it, it does matter because when chemicals are in ionic form, which a lot of the water-soluble fertilizers are, 
they bond with water or they can easily leach out and run down into the water table. Um, you know, and as bad as going in the Lake Erie is, is all this stuff goes down into the water table, too. Mm-hmm. And we don't we just don't need it there. And there are a lot of little small ponds throughout parts of Wisconsin, Illinois, Iowa, or uh, other farming communities where these ponds are just full of so much runoff that kids can't even swim in them. So, so if we can get the if we can get the nutrient to the plant in a in a in a more natural form, locked up in humus, we call that chelated sometimes because what it what it'll be is it's this huge molecule rather than being just like a molecule of nitrogen or ammonia sitting out there, there'll be ammonia wrapped up in this fantastically huge molecule where it's it's stable and it's not going to move. But for roots, roots have an easy time getting into that molecule and pulling off the nitrogen, pulling off the phosphorus, the potassium, the calcium, the sulfur that they need without it being in such an easily available ionic form. So, you know, whenever you can get those, those natural products, manure, leaf compost, leaf mold, your own compost from your kitchen scraps, all that stuff is going to be, um, going to be more helpful to the overall environment. Now, the plant may not differentiate necessarily between whether it gets nitrogen in ionic form or in some big, large molecule, but the overall environment will. So, you know, we always want to try to treat, treat our soils good, and, that's, and that I think is what this is all about. We talk about it in October. October through March is really a time to treat your soils right and give them that organic fertilizer, organic boost that they need so that they'll be productive for you next year. Absolutely. Uh, William, it's always a pleasure to have you on. Where can people find more information about you, and can you give us the link again to the, uh, the, the new creation you put on your website about the, the bulbs? I'll start with that because I really want people to plant more bulbs. There, there, is, there are a few things that bring more joy than, than, than bulbs in the spring. You know, for me, having higher sense and daffodils reminds me of going to Easter Sunday church with my grandmother. So, you know, for me, that, that type of stuff really, you know, bulbs, bulbs are what we wait for all winter long. They finally let us know, hey, okay, when it's going to end. So um, for more tips on that, you can go to Get Out and Grow, all spelled out, G-E-T-O-U-T-A-N-D-G-R-O dot org slash WVG show. And that's just for your listeners. I just put on there. It's a free download of all my favorite bulbs. So, uh, you know, it's just, it's just three pages with, with some info and pictures. And also, if you have any questions, you guys can contact me there, too, and get back in touch and, and let me know. Absolutely. Well, um, go ahead. Um, also, to reach out to me, you can, you can find me there at Get Out and Grow. That's, that's, that's my website. And on Facebook, you can like me at Get Out and Grow as well. So, you know, we're all about getting people outdoors and growing. And um, last thing I want to mention is that, well, not the last thing, i got a million things, but, <laughs> but one more thing I want to mention is that next week I'll be giving a Chicagoland area fall tour where we're going to go look at some great places with fall foliage, and we're also going to check out some good garden designs and see how nature is, is moving through its fall. So if you guys would like to join uh, or, or like to come out, go to the website and you'll find the information there. Well, William, it's always a pleasure to have you on, just full of knowledge, uh, more than we can obtain in 15 minutes. Uh, and, and we always appreciate your time and, and the, the generosity you are uh, with that information. Well, thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure to talk with you guys, and I look forward to our next chat. Absolutely. Thank you, William. Uh, when Take we, care. When we come time. back, your garden questions and our garden answers right after this. A gardening question, you can call into the ivorganic.com hotline at 414-444-5250 right now. Garden seeds do not have to cost a fortune. Just 99 cents at migardener.com. With over 300 varieties of non-GMO, heirloom and organic, flower, vegetable and herb seeds available year-round, pay less and get more seeds. Shipping as low as $2.50. That just makes sense. Go to migardener.com for seeds and gardening needs, tools, and special blend fertilizer. migardener.com. It's that simple. Family owned and operated. Do you have a problem with deer or small herbivores eating your vegetation? There is a natural solution that is safe for your pets and family. Bobex is the answer. An environmentally friendly solution to protect your plants will not wash off and is guaranteed. Bobex deer was independently tested against nine known competitors and rated 93% effective, second only to a physical barrier. Bobex can be used on all types of ornamentals, trees, and shrubs. I support by name at your local independent garden center. Find out more visit bobex.com b-o-b-b-e-x dot c-o-m 
The international food selection at Woodman's is more than just salsa and soy sauce. We stock a huge selection of foods and ingredients from all over the world. Whether it's Asian, Latin American, European, or Middle Eastern, Woodman's has it. Plus, each store has its own unique selection. With Woodman's, you don't need to visit multiple stores to get what you need. We have everything you need under one roof and at a great price. Hi, I'm John Lewandowski, Retail Manager of Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center. Now, I'm not going to tell you about our awesome dome-grown plants, our beautiful pottery, or our 40 varieties of landscape materials. What I am going to tell you is that Blue Mel's is a local, independent, family-owned garden center that truly cares about your garden or landscape project. So if you're looking for that one garden center that actually cares about you, come to Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center. We've been treating our customers like family since 1955. Blue Mel's 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. Traditional gardening, raised bed or container gardening, Joey and Holly are here to get the most out of it. It's the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, your destination for over 1,000 garden videos, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and a whole lot more. Uh, if you want to uh, see about how to ferment or make your own vinegar, you can go there under the watch tab uh, or just go to YouTube and type in the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener homemade vinegar and you'll find that there as well. And if you've got a question uh, or comment, or you can contact us right now on the Ivy Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard Hotline. IvyOrganic.com hotline is 414-444-5250. Ivy Organic 3-in-1 Plant Guard naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn, insects, and rodents, protects newly installed plants and trees, shield pruned and damaged surfaces for use on your roses, fruit and nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. For more information, visit ivorganics.com. Again, that's 414-444-5250. And uh, we have a number of questions come in uh, on uh, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, email, uh, all over the place. One is, uh, when is the best time to harvest sunflowers? Well, So you want to wait till the seeds are fully grown, and then you cut the head off with about a foot stem attached to it. And then you hang it in a dry, airy spot to finish ripening, and then um, basically the seeds will pop out. Right. You don't want to put it in a plastic bag or really a box because then you're going to have a whole bunch of slimy, compostable material that is no good. Um, you can also let it dry on the, on the actual plant in the garden. The problem you have by doing that, like William said, you've got squirrels, you've got mice, you've got birds, you've got everything else out there that's fighting for food. And the birds most likely, when we uh, let the seeds go or let the plant, the sunflower go, the birds will pick everything dry, uh, clean off the, the head of the flower. So you can wrap it with like a cheesecloth or netting and let the seeds mature that way. And that will reduce a lot of the animals from getting to it. But again, you can just cut it off and hanging, hang it um, uh, in, in, the, uh, in, a, in an attic, uh, garage, something like that. Uh, covering your garden with leaves, or here it was a question, covering your garden with leaves, you covered this uh, last week, can I till them in or should I leave them on the top of the ground? Well, you're going to want to leave them on top. You could. You could till them in. Yeah, you could, but here's the problem. You want to cover the problem? You want me to? Uh, you can cover it. The, the problem, if you till your leaves in, whether they're mulched or, or full, you're going to... Uh, allow you're going to kill you're going to o expose the soil to a lot of the atmosphere you're going to potentially kill a lot of worms because of the tiller tines uh you're going to again open it up to the microbial life a lot of this stuff is going into dormancy and by mixing it in the soil uh you're going to uh, disturb a lot of that life structure uh we've never tilled it in you can, yes. You could till one layer in, then put another layer on top type of thing. But again, if you mulch or break them down, they're or break them, uh, tear them apart, mulch them, or shred them, they will break down quicker. Um, how can I freeze broccoli correctly? Right. So many people don't realize that when you're freezing any, pretty much any type of vegetable, if you just put it in a freezer bag and freeze it, it's going to turn to mush after baby food baby food um it'll freeze and then once you thaw it out it's gonna not hold up its its uh shape and desirable qualities so what you want to do is you want to blanch those items so that would be pretty much any vegetable you need to blanch that before you freeze it blanching is simply just a process you're putting you're putting that vegetable into boiling water for about 
two minutes, two to three minutes. Based on the type of vegetable. Right. Yeah. And you can find all these, these guides with a simple Google search. Then you put it into ice, like an ice bath, and it stops that cooking. And now it's when you put it in the freezer bag, it's going to hold up its shape when you bring it out to to cook it. You want a freezer bag. You just don't want the right. El Cheapos you bought on sale. Yeah, and the reason wanna, why... The reason why you want a freezer bag is to help prevent freezer burn. The bag is made with a thicker plastic so that it will help he- keep it up in the freezer. Is there any other alternative besides putting it in a freezer bag? You can use butcher paper, okay. um, and then you would, you would wrap it up and tape it. Um, but you would have to make sure you wrap it properly and tight and everything. So, and I don't know how many people have access to butcher paper. But just try to put in a, in a, uh, a freezer bag and try to suck as much air out of it as possible to prevent the freezer burn. Right. Okay. Uh, let's see here. I want to be more organic and use less chemicals in my home. It can be a challenge. What do you recommend uh, to use? Sure. So, there's many different... Uh, organic or not what less chemical cleaners on the market um, there's stuff that you can get at the store it'll say like green green cleaning or uh, earth friendly eco friendly things like that but simple things such as uh, baking soda and vinegar are really great um, and then there's another product actually which is out of Mequon called rebel green and they have a lot of cleaning products as well and we mentioned them because they've signed on as a sponsor for next year they're coming on uh, they have cleaning products they have uh, toiletries uh, products, so it's Rebel Green. I believe it's rebelgreen.com. Is, uh, but, yeah, they're based out of Mequon. They're local here, so that's a company you might want to look into. Let's see here, uh, another one. Oh, it's not, not even so much a question, but more of a comment. Uh, we talked about uh, problems with our tomatoes, which got a lot of activity on social media a couple of weeks ago. And uh, and actually, I've had, I've had actually several people tell me this. I went to uh, the doctor last this past week and the nurse was saying you know how, how was your garden and i said well it was good but our tomatoes did poorly and she said that she's been hearing that from everybody so this person even came in and said that they had the same problem in new jersey and then uh, even yeah, in Sa- sonia had a had the problem in new jersey she's listen she listens to the program as well as gardening in missouri uh they listen to the program and they also are in the st louis area and they had the same type of problems that we had with the spider mites the bl- uh, the white flies the Early blight, the late blight, and all that other stuff that goes along the, the diseases that we ha- had. Um, so, okay. So, how late is too late to plant fall garlic? We talked about this. I don't think it was last week. A couple weeks before, uh, weeks ago. Uh, it's not too late. You you kind of want, and it's, and it's hard to kind of gauge, is because you don't know what the weather's going to do. Realistically, you want to get your garlic in the ground about one month before your soil freezes. Kind of like what William talked about, the bulbs being in the ground before it freezes. Their stuff's going to go on, even though it's stuff's frozen. You want them to get established, roots developed, established before the ground freezes. So if you can get them in, a, you know, a month, two weeks, whatever the case is, to accelerate that root development before the bulb, before the ground freezes, you can pre-soak your bulbs in water or what we use is an authentic Haven brand manure tea. It's an all-organic material. They're a sponsor next year. Um, and that accelerates. That's basically an energy drink for the bulb to hydrate it in, or the clove to hydrate internally to develop the roots quicker so you can get a better root establishment before it basically goes into dormancy over the winter months. So with that being said, you're always welcome to send us a question uh, on uh, TWVG Radio, TWVG Show, or TWVG Radio at gmail.com, TWVG Show at gmail.com, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, however you want to go about doing it. This show is brought to you by the s- companies you've heard throughout the, the hour, as well as... Nasella Kabuchi is the executive sponsor of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Nasella is made in Wisconsin with local tea and natural herbs. Look for it in the refrigerator aisle at your local grocery. If you don't see it, ask for it, because if it's not Nasella Kombucha, it's not kombucha. You can find out more at nasella.com. Programming note, join us next week. Where we'll go over 11 things you can do with those pears and apples that you're harvesting or uh, picking, as well as five vegetables that you can grow successfully in your home over the winter months and how to do that as and well as we're going to have guest Gary Oppenheimer and he is from ampleharvest.org ampleharvest.org uh, he's going to talk about what what the problems are we talked about food waste in America he's going to go over that and uh, how gardeners are helping food shelter uh, food food uh, pantries food banks 
to feed the homeless. So uh, all that and your garden questions. Miss any portion of this show or want to revisit it in its entirety, find that under the radio tab on the website, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, as well as highlights of specific interviews and topics on the highlight tab on the right-hand side. Until next week, for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden.